welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight we'll see excerpts from a recent conference on diversity. This first diversity symposium was sponsored by the U.S. Conference of Religions for Peace, a national organization representing various Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and other uh, faiths for the purpose of getting religion involved in the bettering of public life in the United States. The conference was put on with the assistance of a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. The WordPath Society coordinated with USCRP so that the symposium was held in Norman on October 18th in the afternoon immediately preceding our annual celebration of Oklahoma Indian language and culture <clears throat> because the symposium was about Indians, non-Indians, diversity, and language. Now first, let's hear the opening prayer for the symposium, which was given by Lawrence Hart, who is executive director of the Cheyenne Cultural Center, and then some remarks by Tony Kiriopoulos, executive director of the U.S. Conference of Religions for Peace. Thank you. 
Next, some excerpts from the remarks of Barbara Warner, who is Executive Director of the Oklahoma Indian Affairs Commission. Uh, it is certainly my pleasure to, to come down here and, first of all, congratulate you for having the uh, wherewithal to recognize that language is an important aspect of culture, especially the American Indian culture. But all cultures, uh, the one thing that separates our culture, and, and that includes our language, our traditions, our history. And it's all unique to you, to our each individual tribes. So we're very proud of that. And, and, and we, we appreciate the uniqueness that we have. And in Oklahoma, especially where we get so many tribes that were walked here, were forced to leave here, we're not from this area. And, and we get to learn how to coexist with other tribes. We never really put contact with them. Finally, some excerpts from the remarks of Dr. Blue Clark, 
who is interim director of the Native American Legal Resource Center at Oklahoma City University's School of Law. Oh, well, Bill. This is Jay on Nunma, Mormon, uh, Oktin. Tahoe Chiska, the Lari Hilvagi, of course. Rebelgal, Homes. Oida Amitawa, of course. Tulsa Machase, and Choco Tarko. Casita Tarko, and Migo Saka. So, I'm going to ask the chapter, let's go. Mother, I said, ha, I'm free to eat. The weed is my town, New Tulsa is my ground, Big Casita is my church, I'm covering all the bases when I go up there. Native Americans are invisible for much of United States society and for policy makers. Protection of the First Amendment. 
Justice Antonin Scalia, in the opinion, made a quite disturbing observation which is relevant to us here. He found that it was, and I quote for you, courting anarchy in the United States because of social pluralism or diversity. Courting anarchy because of diversity. This is an enemy of the nation. I don't make this up. You can go read it. Society, he continued, must coerce and suppress them. Is this a script you're reading from, Mr. Clark? No, this is a Supreme Court opinion. The so-called judicial new federalism underway in the United States now and since 1980-81 for the Indians harkens back to the very worst aspects of the Dawes allotment era, and I've struck terror in Lawrence's heart, being a Cheyenne, he, his tribe underwent it, as did many others. This was a policy in the 1880s, beginning in the 1880s, actually beginning from the first arrival of non-Indians on the continent, but especially a national policy beginning in the 1880s with the Henry Dawes Allotment and Severalty Act in uh, 1887 and extending into the 1930s that chopped up Indian reservations and allotted those uh, in severalty to individual Indians and then the whole rest of it, if they took this section for the Indians and assigned them farms, then this whole rest of this section was devoted to surplus and it was opened up to non-Indians or whites and it was sold to the federal government to pay for the expenses of robbing this section from the Indians. You can take a whole course, and uh, I've just compressed it down to <laughs> Blue Clark's philosophy. Justice Rehnquist has stated in 1999 in uh, the Neil Lacks uh, decision, admittedly in a dissent, but barely. He stated in 1999 that American Indian treaty rights are, and I quote, temporary and precarious because they're about to disappear. While Justice Sandra Day O'Connor agreed, adding that because Congress is the source of all Indian rights, and I'm quoting, Congress can eliminate the right whenever it wishes to do so. I don't know if you're alarmed, but my blood pressure goes up. Justice Scalia wrote a summary of this 19th century approach, which is still used by the court, to, to Indian, uh, this approach to Indian reservations and Indian rights, when he noted that Indian reservation and rights will, and I quote, fade over time. American Indian culture, in spite, in spite of all of these assaults, uh, continues uh, here in Indian country. Uh, some examples, uh, you could watch uh, Indian elders uh, 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 quilting at uh, Wetumpka Indian Baptist Church, uh, in which one generation, that is grandchildren, granddaughters, one generation is learning from another generation. Women, the foundation of the uh, culture and society, teaching the future generation uh, about that culture, tying the generations uh, together, tying the history together, using the native language. Uh, another example, if you're in Indian country and uh, look out through your windows, a young couple marry with an eagle feather uh, to the music of a drum or to taped American Indian music. An elder pastor conducts a Christian service speaking in a tribal language. I probably have uh, reminded Lawrence of uh, such activities in Western Oklahoma. Another example of the survival of native culture and language, a grandchild half listens as grandmothers and aunts talk under the shade of a tree about the last time that they saw an overlay stitch used in Indian beadwork. 
for the American Indian, in spite of centuries of oppression and occupation of their lands, the loon still cries out, coyote still plays tricks as he always has, the sacred fire still continues to burn, and songs are even now sung to bring up the welcomed and coming sunrise. Czesław Milos, the Polish poet and professor and Nobel Prize winner in literature, in his Nobel lecture upon receiving his prize, said, and I quote, those who are alive receive a mandate from those who are gone and silent forever. They can fulfill their duties only by trying to reconstruct precisely the spirit of things in memory of those who went on before us. I turn also lastly to Irene Nakai, uh, a, an American Indian poet, and read one of her poems, which is brief, blessedly brief. I must be like a bridge for my people. I may connect time, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, for my people who are in transition also. I must be enough in tomorrow to give warning if I should. I must be enough in yesterday to hold a cherished secret. Does it seem like we are walking as one? That is the goal. And among my favorites is uh, Lucy Tapahanso, whom I brought to Cal State Long Beach uh, in a year in which she would prevent me from mentioning long ago, before she became famous as a Navajo poet. Uh, she, well, anyway, long time ago. And one of my favorites is still uh, one of her favorites. It stresses the importance of place and home and that pull of traditional culture. One more poem. This road winds smooth into the belly of the earth. The rocks tinged to blood red. Cliffs bare and hard like ribs surround this place dry and strong. Sure as children return. This car wakes dust swirling around, never ending. I can hardly see the damp ditch weeds hovering over the water there, clear and cold in this hot, dry land of the American Southwest. I still taste rain-fresh dirt and good, firm songs this land had given, and returning prayers circle slow and even into the belly of this land. American Indians are blessed people. We must give thanks to our ancestors who brought us to this point. In spite of their own long struggles, we must honor their memory. We who gather here must be aware of our obligation to our past. We must keep the vision alive, appreciate the native language. And as, as a conclusion, I have a language test for you. We will end in the finest of native languages, that is Creek language. <laughs> is there any other? And, and this is a participatory, two words. Uh, I will give the uh, syllables for you uh, each. Say ma. Ma. Do. Do. Put it together. Ma do. Ho. Ho. Wa. Wa. Gi. Gi. Put it together. Ho wa. Ho wa. You said thank you, ugly. Ma <laughs> <laughs> do. More presentations from the First Diversity Symposium, Third Path's fifth, an fifth annual celebration of Oklahoma Indian language and culture on future shows. See you next time on Word Path. I'm Alice Anderton, host of Word Path. We feature the 24 languages spoken by Oklahoma Indian tribes. <laughs> You say, Quasu.
Join us for more Golden Oldies, Monday and Wednesday evenings.